welcome to a CanCon interview on PFAS and essential uses. Again in a virtual setting, but soon live again since COVID restrictions in Europe are slowly lifted. Talking about restrictions, the EU has the intention to restrict the use of PFAS. For approximately 80 years, we have been discovering the magic wonders of PFAS, a group of fluorinated substances with unique properties that include water, heat, chemical and fire resistant properties. No wonder it is used in a wide range of consumer products that people use in their daily life, such as cell phones, pizza boxes, guitar strings, climbing ropes, cosmetics, etc. A true midsummer night's dream. But with the adverse health effects of PFAS, also a nightmare. That is why, in the EU's chemical strategy for sustainability, the Commission proposes actions that ensure the use of PFAS is phased out, unless it is proven essential for society. But what is essential? A complex topic, so I'm happy to discuss this with two PFAS professionals. Natasha Subrizai, Regulatory and Government Affairs Manager at 3M, and from the Dutch Authority, Martijn Beekman, Project Manager, Reach PFAS Restriction at the Dutch National Institute for Public Health and Environment. Welcome. Natasha, before we start looking into the EU PFAS Restriction Initiative and a discussion on essential use, could you sketch what PFAS are and what their functionality is? Sure. Uh, PFAS stands for a broad group of perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Uh, the group contains several categories and classes of durable chemicals and materials with a wide range of properties that include oil, uh, water, temperature, chemical uh, and fire resistance, as you already mentioned, but also, for example, the electrical insulating properties. And such characteristics are critical for use in important products uh, and applications among, among many industries. Uh, so it's not only consumer products, um, there are also a lot of industrial applications. Um, different classes of PFAS may be also used in the manufacturing of a, a variety of products. And beyond certain well-known consumer applications, um, like uh, carpet protectant, for example, PFAS are also used in important products such as, for example, uh, medical devices, uh, for example, surgical gowns and drapes, where they help prevent infections. Uh, they are also critical to the manufacturing of electronic devices, such as uh, cell phones and semiconductors, for example, um, as well as commercial aircraft and uh, low emission vehicles, for example, rely heavily on PFAS technology. Okay, thank you. PFAS, they are also nicknamed forever chemicals since they are extremely resistant to environmental degradation, a huge concern. Furthermore, PFAS is linked to a variety of, to, of adverse health effects. Martijn, could you outline some of these concerns? Yes, indeed. Uh, PFAS are, have as a common concern this extreme persistency, which will mean that when, when it's released to the environment, they will stay there more or less forever, as you said, forever chemicals. Uh, further, some of the PFASs are linked to bioaccumulation, so they will end up in human bodies or in, or in animals. And others are more mobile substances, so they move easily through, the, through our waterways and can, for example, affect uh, the drinking water supply, as we also see this in the Netherlands. Uh, so there are, it's a large group of chemicals with, with different uh, properties. Uh, and finally, I should mention some of them, and of course, they these are already restricted in Europe, but also on a global level, have shown to be well, toxic for the reproduction or similar health effects. Okay. As mentioned, in the EU's chemical strategy for sustainability, actions to address the use of PFAS are proposed. Currently, the competent authorities of five member states are preparing an analysis of the restriction options for PFAS. Martijn, what steps have been taken so far in this analysis? Yeah, so I... I will try to describe the, well, the process from more or less from start to the end. So I see three important phases. So the first phase is the preparation phase. We are in the preparation phase now. So we have done several studies uh, over the last one, one and a half year to find out where PFASs are used, what are the missions, etc. are. We intend to submit uh, a restriction dossier in, uh, July next year. And then the next phase will start, then the scientific committees of the European Chemicals Agency will have to formulate its opinion. That will take more or less one year. And then uh, the dossier is handed over to Brussels 
and then it's going to the, the to the policy process and that will well take another at least another year i would say okay um natasha to anticipate the practical impact of restriction a lot of relevant economic and emission data is collected to better understand the importance of pfas and people's alternatives in industry uh, industry plays an important role there. Could you tell us more about the involvement of industry in providing these necessary information pieces to the authorities? Of course. Um, although I cannot talk for all industry players, uh, 3M, for example, uh, tried to provide as much information as possible uh, within the given time frames, both during the first call for evidence, uh, so in July last year, uh, as well as during the individual sector specific studies that have been running between, I believe, October and pretty much now. Uh, I think there were around 12 or 14 of them. Uh, considering a very broad definition that the authorities uh, choose to use for this restriction, uh, the scope of uses, of course, is extremely large uh, and touching upon many different sectors. Uh, including some of them um, a bit more complex, uh, like medical devices, as mentioned, electronics, semiconductors, energy, automotive, aerospace, etc. So this requires, of course, quite a lot of communication uh, and awareness raising among different actors along the supply chain. Uh, sometimes, of course, also with uh, sharing some business uh, sensitive um, or business confidential information. Uh, and of course, at the end, also each and every company needs to do their own internal analysis, so screening of all the uses. So currently we are conducting some further studies, for example, trying to understand the, the risk management, the socioeconomic impact, uh, as well as end of life uh, aspects, uh, which I know um, the authorities also are considering. Okay. Uh, Martijn, you already mentioned that there is a lot of information that is currently processed. Uh, I know that uh, around mid-July you expect to have some summaries of uh, the analysis available for, for review by, uh, by stakeholders, partly. Could you sketch the next phases of the restriction process? So when is the registry of intention scheduled for and when do you think that the RAC and SEAC will start drafting their opinions? Yeah, so as as said by Natasha and also by you, um, there are a lot of different PFAS applications and we realize that and I am very much appreciate all the effort put in by stakeholders, by industry to, to come up with information. Uh, and indeed, uh, the next step will be that around mid-July, we will present at least the findings we have so far in a form of a summary because, well, if you would present everything, it would be a large pile of information. So we try to summarize to, to uh, show the most important aspects, at least in our view, which we need for the further development of the dossier. And that gives the opportunity to stakeholders to check this information and also to fill some data gaps. Because you will see in these summaries, there will be a lot of gaps, a lot of data gaps, because we so far didn't find the information. And I think it's wise to to have another consultation round to try to see if we can uh, make the dossier as good as possible. So that consultation will run more or less from mid-July till mid-September. Uh, we plan to start uh, or to, to put the, our intention on the risk of intention of ECA also by mid-July. So it's more or less at the same time. And that will mean after you have placed uh, your intention there, you are uh, obliged to submit the dossier within 12 months. So that will automatically mean that we are aiming for a dossier submission uh, July next year. So midsummer, very good, Martijn. Uh, <laughs> maybe good to clarify it. You, you say there are gaps that need to be filled. Uh, you mentioned it's a kind of uh, next consultation, but the consultation is very narrow. It focuses to help filling the gaps. It's not another round of complete stakeholder involvement. Yeah, that's right. Especially about these persistent uh, chemicals or PBT substances. You see that tonnages are very important. Uh, the amounts emitted to the environment are very important because in the end, that's what we want to, to avoid, the emission of PFAS to the environment uh, and the costs for replacement. These are the really key issues here. Now, in due time, uh, the Commission will ban all uses of PFAS and only allow use when it's essential for society. 
What the term essential use will include is still up for debate. But if there are suitable alternatives available, a use is likely non-essential. Natasha, industry is always spending a lot of time and money on research and development and innovation. Are PFAS alternatives readily available? Uh, thank you, Tirza. That's a good question. <laughs> Uh, maybe let me answer by providing some additional thoughts for consideration. Um, so firstly, I think it's important that we understand and that we are clear whether we talk about um, the use or essential use of a chemical in a product or uh, of the final product. Um, and second of all, um, I think also very important, as mentioned before, there's a large variety of uses covering many different sectors, uh, ranging, of course, from consumer to industrial applications, um, where yeah, PFAS is critical for the needed performance of products or use in the manufacturing process, for example. So to give just a few examples here, uh, without the use of certain fluorinated materials, uh, we would for example, today still have much more polluting cars on our streets today. We would have less energy efficient and less safe buildings. Uh, we, would we wouldn't have, for example, a large scale manufacturing of electronic devices or medicines, um, etc. So in some specific instances, uh, those products uh, could, of course, exist uh, without the use of fluorinated materials but we might be compromising on the performance uh, or safety of products. Um, so I would say it's a more complex um, case uh, with you know, many different layers and we shouldn't probably just generalize on saying are alternatives ready, readily available or not. Um, and also as, as highlighted by Martin before, um, there are, uh, of course, environmental concerns out there, uh, but we shouldn't forget that uh, in most of the industrial applications, the emissions can be largely controlled. Um, uh, so overall, I think we just need to strike a right balance between, of course, having regulation that drives behavioral change, uh, but doesn't necessarily create a situation where, you know, industry can no longer provide products that are important for, I don't know, decarbonization or safety of people. Um, and fluorinated chemicals, in our opinion, can be very valuable to our society. Um, and certainly they can be, and they are an enabler of the green transition as well. Uh, but of course, they have to be reviewed together with their uses and emissions, which I think is what the authorities try to do as well. Okay, thank you for your industry view on this uh, complex uh, essential use uh, topic. We cover a few of these items uh, later on in the interview. Um, but as stated, that PFAS are known as forever chemicals since they last virtually forever in our environment. Essential use, however, is not forever. So in the essential use spectrum, we could define nice to have and need to have. Uh, Martijn, is there already some consensus of what is foreseen to be essential use? Well, the, the short answer is no. <laughs> uh, there is no consensus yet. There is a lot of discussion going on. Uh, you probably are aware that the European Commission also mentioned the essential use concept in their chemi chemical strategy. And they are aiming to come up with criteria by the end of 2022. So that's well, one and a half year ahead of us. Uh, and I see a lot of papers, uh, both scientific papers, but also policy papers coming in discussing this issue. Uh, and I don't see any consensus yet, but uh, I think it, it, it is interesting and it's also very re related to the PFAS work as uh, clearly ex explained by Natasha that there are a lot of PFAS uses for important uh, applications nowadays. So we have to be carefully consider this, uh, that, that's clear. It is not an easy discussion. You cannot say, oh, we just replace all PFASs. No, it's not that easy. I am totally aware of that. Um, so the, I think there are def, different layers in it. One is, of course, the technical aspect. Are there technical alternatives available which perform equally well or more or less equally well? Because sometimes you don't need to have it exactly equally. There is a lot of over the design, I think, in many applications. Uh, so then it might be a bit uh, long lasting. Uh, for example, fluoropolymers can say, uh, 
uh, very well performing over decades in the product, even in mobile phones. Well, I don't know how often you change your mobile phone, but <laughs> normally after a few years, it's a, it's a, you want to have an update, I would say. So I think uh, you have to really look into the details to, to, to consider. But coming back to your question on the essentiality, yes, <laughs> there is a lot of discussion uh, ahead of us. We already mentioned that there might be a friction between PFAS restriction and the ambitious European Green Deal, since they could be competing objectives. When asked about chemicals helping to fight climate change, for instance via solar panels or wind turbines, EU Commission's Executive Vice President Frans Timmermans stated, health is the primary concern. So Martijn, will the Member State PFAS restriction analysis provide helpful information for the prioritization process? Yes, I think, uh, well, we, as explained uh, before, we are trying to get a clear picture on all uses of PFAS, including these uses in solar panels, uh, windmills, etc., as mentioned by you. So uh, we also will pay very specific attention to these, well, uh, uses needed for the, the Green Deal aspect. So definitely will, it will give information about uh, how much PFAS it is used and what are the concerns about the emissions. So as in, indeed, I think that will be helpful for that discussion as well. Uh, maybe to, to highlight, of course, and it reflects also to a remark from Natasha, uh, when we are doing that and looking to these uh, uh, applications, we should consider the whole life cycle. So not only the use phase, but also what after a product is come to the end of life and how is a product manufactured? Because you also see quite some emissions at the, the beginning or at the end side. So also a windmill is not there forever. What will happen after the windmill is outdated or if a car is going to the scrap, uh, how can we uh, well recover the, the PFAS used over there? If I may add also, um, you mentioned the, the human health effects, just to say that, of course, not all PFAS have the same uh, uh, characteristics or properties in this sense. So we should also be careful to, to understand what PFAS are used in products. Um, so I think we really need to go a little bit more granular trying to understand which PFAS are used and uh, what is their let's say, um, health or environmental fate at the end. Um, not all of them will be bioaccumulative. Not all of them will be mobile neither. So uh, it's really important to do, I think, a granular risk assessment for, for different uses um, there. So, so of course, I see that there are many different PFAS with many different characteristics. So that part I agree with, Natasha. But I think if you look to what you call legacy PFAS, I see several of them are still in use. Uh, of course, the, the, the PFOA, the PFAS, they have been banned, but they have been replaced by very similar compounds. And if you look to the recent EFSA opinion, it shows that the health effects are, well, also at very, very low levels. So I, I'm concerned about the health effect of uh, also the, the replacements of the legacy uh, PFAS. But of course, I agree that like uh, the fluoropolymers, that's an other category. But then you have to realize what will happen with the fluoropolymers, for example, when you incinerate them. Then again, shorter PFAS molecule will be formed. And how? what are the effects of these ones? Uh, so uh, I think the, the picture is a bit more <laughs> complicated. And, uh, and of course, the overall concern is that once the PFAS is uh, produced and used in products, and then going in the end, it will go to the environment because they will not break down and it will stay there. So that's the overall concern. That's the persistency. Yeah, no, it shows again the need eh, for industry and other stakeholders to provide all this information. So which PFAS is used in which product for what use? Are there alternatives? And then the commission, uh, uh, based on the information provided, can make a, a better uh, decision between what is essential and what is not essential, uh, but with the overall aim, uh, the majority of all the PFAS will be banned from Europe, and therefore also globally, uh, most likely, because other jurisdictions like the US and Asia uh, are most likely following uh, uh, Europe in this. 
Um, let's go for one more item. We already discussed the mobile phone. Uh, and 20 years ago, nobody expected a mobile phone with or without PFAS to be essential. Now, most of the public will consider a mobile phone essential. New innovations the coming decades might emerge that could benefit from PFAS and be a future essential use. So let's stick with the mobile phone example, which turned from a simple phone into a data-driven device. In recent years, more data has been created than ever before in human history. All around the globe, data centers pop up and they require a lot of space, energy and water, partly due to the need to cool the data servers. Natasha, I know that 3M has come up with an immersion cooling technique using PFAS that can considerably reduce the need for energy and water, and in that way reduce the carbon footprint. But as already mentioned by Martijn, can you also then make closed loops? Can you ensure minimum losses during service life? And how about end of life? Can you tell us more about that? Um, yes, I mean, uh, the example you, you mentioned uh, here, certainly the closed loops are possible uh, and, and the emissions can be efficiently managed or minimized um, already today. So yeah, it is possible and on other aspects you mentioned uh, also uh, when it comes to the recycling systems. Uh, although of course uh, still a lot more has to happen there. Um, overall the recycling systems can be possible and uh, S3M we are already looking into this also with our customers and partners. Okay, thank you. Martijn, any last considerations? Yeah. So I can, of course, not preempt any outcome of the restriction and dossier or proposal we make. We will prepare a dossier. Uh, and in the end, it's up to the politicians to decide upon uh, which PFAS to restrict or which users to restrict. So uh, the only thing I can say at this moment, uh, good information will always be very helpful. So if there are uses which you consider very important, I avoid the word essential in this case, but important uses, and you provide us with the information on tonnage, but as also about emissions or the lack of emissions in that case, that would be, of course, very helpful in uh, the dossier development. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, time to put this interview also in the global data centers. Natasha and Martijn, thank you very much for your essential input in the PFAS restriction debate. Let's jointly work together with all stakeholders towards implementing a real midsummer night's dream.